Aging and disease are biochemical processes that happen over many decades. So if we track and optimize well-established biomarkers of organ and systemic health, can aging and disease risk be slowed? So with that in mind, earlier this month, I blood tested for the fourth time in 2023. And with that in mind, what's my biological age? So we can see that data here. This is using Dr. Morgan Levine's phenotypic age calculator as an index of biological age. And if you have blood test data and you want to calculate your own biological age using Levine's test, the PhenoAge link will be in the video's description. So when entering these data, including albumin, creatinine, glucose, etc., I get a biological age of 34.5 years, which is about 16 years younger than my chronological. Now note that for the 11th consecutive test, Quest's high sensitivity C-reactive protein measurement was less than 0.3 milligrams per liter. So CRP could be lower than 0.3 milligrams per liter, further reducing my biological age, but that's the limit of their detection. It's not higher than 0.3 milligrams per liter. And rather than looking at data on a spreadsheet, all blood test data, screenshots of the lab report are included later in the video. Now note that this is just one test. For more context, let's have a look at biological age results since 2018, as I now have 26 blood tests over that time period. And that's what we can see here. So from 2018 to 2019, I tested three times with an average biological age of 36.1 years. Then over 2020 to 2021, I tested 12 times with an average of 35.6 in both 2020 and 2021. Over seven tests in 2022, I significantly reduced that to 33.8 years. And if you missed those videos, there, some of them will be in the right corner. And thus far, over the first four tests in 2023, I'm on par or a little bit below where I was for 2022 with an average in 2023 of 33.6 years. Now, I compared 2020 to 2023 data using a two-sample t-test. So when we look at the 12 tests over 2020 to 2021 versus or compared with 2022 to 2023, the 11 tests so far over those two years, that's a significant reduction. The, the last 11 tests are significantly reduced when compared with the 12 tests from 2020 to 2021, you can see the p-value is less than 0.05. Now, phenoage, Levine's test, isn't the only metric that I use to assess biological age. I also use aging.ai. So what's my aging.ai age? So aging.ai is also free to use, and it includes 19 biomarkers, which we can see here. So if anyone wants to double check the numbers, you can enter it here using the North American data set. So when entering these data, I get a biological age of 31 years which is about 19 years younger than my chronological. And just like we did for Levine's test, for more context, let's have a look at previous data for aging.ai age, which is what we can see here. And so for aging.ai, I have 41 blood tests since 2009. So from 2009 to 2013, I wasn't measuring very often, only three times over a five-year span. And we can see that my average aging.ai age was 32 years over those three tests. So then in 2016, uh, in 2016, I started testing more often. And from 2016 to 2022, I tested 34 times with an average aging.ai age of 29.8 years. All right, so what about 2023? So thus far over the first four tests with the latest test in gold, my average aging.ai age is also 29.8 years. In other words, my aging.ai age has been stable. The average aging.ai age has been stable for the past eight years. So what may be contributing to these biological age reductions, diet and or supplements? And that will be in the next video that I'll release on Wednesday, July, July 19th of 2023. But for now, let's dig into the full blood test report, which is what we can see here. So a couple of highlights, Quest uh, flagged my total white blood cells as low at 3.6, um, 3.6 thousand white blood cells per microliter. And that's because their reference range is 3.8 to 10.8 thousand white blood cells per microliter. But note that the reference range is generally not what's optimal for health and potentially longevity. The reference range is just basically the normal distribution within a population. It isn't intended to assess all cause mortality risk, or at least not yet. Hopefully that'll change at some point in the future. So to illustrate that point, let's take a look at a study for white blood cell count in terms of survival rate plotted against years after the baseline white blood cell assessment. So first, when starting with uh, 3,500 to 6,000 white blood cells per microliter, and when looking at median survival, that's 0.05 uh, survival, that's a survival rate of 0.05, 
That's the time when half the population has died and half is still alive. And I've said that so many times in animal studies, so it's rare that we see this in a human study. So when looking at median survival, we can see that those in the 3,500 to 6,000 white blood cell count per microliter, or 3.5 to 6, had a life expectancy of about 38 years. In contrast, 6,000 to 10,000 white blood cells per microliter, note again, that's still within the reference range, the Quest Labs reference range, they had a significantly shorter life expectancy of about 30 years. And then still, for people who had white blood cell counts at the baseline visit of greater than 10,000 white blood cells per microliter, again, 10.8 is the upper limit of Quest Labs reference range. So this is, some of this is going to be within that range. They had the shortest life expectancy of about 25 years. So about a 13 year age life expectancy difference between people who had more than 10,000 uh, white blood cells per microliter versus 3,500 to 6,000. So what about less than 3,500 as my data is technically, well, not technically, but it's right on that border at 3.6. So it looks like it's the shortest life expectancy of all the four groups, but note that there were only 49 subjects in that group and that association wasn't statistically significant. So from this, from this study, we can see that 3.5 to 6 or 3,500 to 6,000 white blood cells may be optimal in terms of life expectancy. Now note that just focusing on one test may not be the best way to assess all-cause mortality risk. Since 2015, I have 42 tests for white blood, cell, uh, white blood cell levels, and my average over those 42 tests is 4.6. So even though my 3.6 is right on that border of 3,500 to 6,000, we can see that I'm right within that optimal range of 3,500 to 6,000 uh, at 4,600 or 4.6 thousand white blood cells per microliter. Now, something else I want to point out is, uh, or ask, is are neutrophils too low? We can see that for this test, they were 1519, and Quest's reference range is 1500 to 7800. So I'm right on that border based on their reference range. So to assess that, let's take a look at all-cause mortality risk, as, as shown here, plotted against neutrophil counts on the y-axis. And when compared with 2 to 3, or 2,000 to 3,000 neutrophils per microliter, which was defined as the reference, we can see that having higher than 3,000 neutrophils per microliter was significantly associated with a, an increased all-cause mortality risk. We can see that the confidence interval, the 95% conf confidence interval, the data that's in parentheses, is completely above the hazard ratio of 1. Similarly, neutrophils that were less than 2,000, or 2 uh, times you know, 10 to the 3 neutrophils per microliter, was also associated with a significantly increased all-cause mortality risk. So from this study, we can see that 2,000 to 3,000 neutrophils may be optimal in terms of all-cause mortality risk. So note that, the, again, the reference range includes some of the increased all-cause mortality risk from 1,500 to 2,000, but also from 3,000 to 7,800. So once again, we can see that the reference range is generally not what's optimal for health and potentially longevity. And also based on this study, my 1519 would put me at an increased all-cause mortality risk. Uh, in, sorry, an increased all-cause mortality risk. But I'm not too worried about that. It's just one test. And if we look at my uh, 42 test average for neutrophils since 2015, it's 2299, right within that 2000 to 3000 range. All right, finishing up the blood test, we can see the lipid panel, HSCRP, and glucose. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links and merch that you may be, may be interested in, including at-home metabolomics, NAD quantification, green tea, epigenetic testing, oral microbiome composition, at-home blood testing with CyFox Health. And note that their panel of biomarkers is almost exclusively different from the at-home metabolomics as it includes, for example, ApoB, diet tracking, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Die Trying brand, that link and all the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. Hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.